chapter 32 and verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he had saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your blessings upon your word here this morning. I just thank you as your word goes forth that it cuts between soul and spirit. It's this amazing, sharp, two-edged sword that brings life, God. And we just thank you for your work and your life-giving uh, work that you're doing in our hearts as a result of your work here this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen, amen. You know, when it comes to the story and referencing the history of Jacob, as we touched on last week, I have uh, heard many messages about him. I actually even feel he's been kind of given a bad rap, but you know, hey, he was in ministry. <laughs> People will say whatever they, you know, they'll, they'll paint it. And um, obviously he had his ups and downs. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but in this portion of scripture, we find him in the wrestling match of his life. Although this is the wrestling match of his life, this is not where it started. As we talked about last week, it began as he wrestled in the womb. As he began his wrestling match in that time coming forth, in the breaking forth of the birth, and literally the, his hand that he has grabbed a hold of Esau's heel. The literally went a part of the naming of, who, of, of his parents naming him. It actually means, Jacob means heel grabber. Um, supplanter. There's different definitions of it um, that, that I heard. And I've done a lot of focus on the deceiver and the supplanter. Maybe it was just because it was a heel grabber. I don't know. Parents have a lot of reasons for naming their children these days. Um, and every generation seems to have different ideas. And, but maybe it was just because he was grabbing his brother's heel. I, we really obviously don't know, but in that day, the wrestling match was more important because the firstborn got the greater inheritance than the secondborn. It's a lot more different when the twins are today. We're just, oh, look how cute, you know, and they fight over who's the oldest growing up, even if it's only a couple minutes. But in that day, it meant the larger portion of the inheritance. It meant the birthright. It meant so much more. And in Jacob's life, we see his testimony of his ups and downs where he's reaching forth and still coming up short. And I don't know if there's anybody here this morning that you can relate to that testimony where you feel like so many times in life that you've reached for something only to come up um, for something short for what you're reaching for. We find that, that Jacob reaching forth and having a hold of Esau's heel is how he started this wrestling thing called called life. We find that as he goes from deceiving his father, just not even on his own turn, it was actually his mother that instructed him. And there was a lot of blessings to be in a mother's boy. Can I hear an amen here this morning? There's power in being the mother's boy. We can see that between Jacob and Esau, Esau was not the mother's boy. It was the father's boy. He was the one that his father was proud of. He'd go out and hunt. He was the man's man. He would kick your tail. He, would, he, would, he was just this man's man. While Jacob was given the title as the man that stayed in tents, Esau was the hunter. When it came time to him going before his father to try to present himself like his brother, we talked about last week how crazy it is. You've got to be a hairy guy to have goat's hair be the thing to resemble who you are. And that's the King James Version. I mean, he was a hairy guy. So we've got to have our heart go out for poor Esau's wife because um, I can't imagine if I was going to deceive my dad and have to cover my arm with goat's hair, he had to be an ugly guy. So... He, he, he was a hairy man, but yet 
under the instruction of his mother, we find him actually deceiving his father. But at least he had an unction. He had a desire that we find that he wanted the father's blessing. He didn't take it for granted, nor did he count it as something that was inexpensive. But yet, in the place of the birthright, when Esau was so hungry, even though he wasn't as strong, he couldn't beat his brother in an arm wrestling match, Jacob did know how to cook. And we talked last week in reference to not being so focused on other people's strengths and where we are weak, that maybe they may be stronger than you in one area, but whether it's a stone in your pocket or whether you can cook, then baby, you better be cooking. If that's your strength, cook it. If that's your strength, if that's what you know to do, he was able to cook that stew. He was able to cook that soup in such a way that when it came time that Esau traded his birthright for his bowl of soup. And although Esau didn't count it as something that was costly as his birthright, Jacob had enough unction to say, that birthright is mine. I want it, even if you don't think it's that big of a deal, it's a desire. Jacob, we can see, seemed to have this passion on the inside of him that was uh, superseding that of his brother. We can see that Jacob had a passion that after he goes along and as he's sent off from his home because Esau, when he came back to find out that his brother had deceived his father for the father's blessing, what came out of his mouth was, I'm going to kill him. And his mother, who gave him the instruction on what to do, now said, son, Esau said he's going to kill you. It's best that you leave. Run. You better get out of here because he will kill you. So he goes to uh, his mother's brother's area and house and that's where he finds out. And you do reap what you sow because as he deceived his father, he finds that that which he thought he was marrying, little did he know that he was not marrying who he thought he was. It wasn't until the veil was lifted for who she really was that he realized, I have married somebody that I didn't think that I was marrying. And you'll find that as he was in the beginning and the deception that he reaps what he sows. But one thing about it was he was a passionate man and he was willing to work not just seven years, but 14 years for his wife. Not everybody can testify that they worked seven years for their wife, you know. That's just a side note there, some revelation that's (laughs) coming to me. I mean, not everybody can testify that they're... (laughs) <laughs> that, that, that they are worth that, that, that he worked. And he, he yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't hear any amens here this morning. I feel like you're leaving me high and dry, but amen. thank you. <laughs> oh. Well, it's like a fish story. It gets longer every time it's told, but. Listen, look, if you want to preach next Sunday, you have full welcome to get up and preach. I'm good, thanks. Let's see, where was I? Um, Thank you. We find that he reaped what he sowed, yet he still had enough where God's hand was upon him in such a way that he left. Matter of fact, One of the reasons why Laban didn't want him to leave, Laban recognized the favor of God on him in such a way that when he came to his house that he flourished because Jacob was there. Now, I don't want you to get fired because you're walking in pride, but if your business owners knew about the blessings of just you being there, what it brings to the company. If they knew what it was like for someone who has the hand of God upon them, that it just doesn't affect you to be blessed. That's a part of you being a blessing to those you're around. And Jacob understood that. Laban knew it more so, and he tried keeping them as long as he could. But he ends up leaving anyways, and he leaves a blessed man. There's a lot of reasons, a lot of history behind and testimony behind that. But as he goes, we find him in such a way that God begins to instruct him that it's time to go back home. It's time to go back, and he has to face the very thing that he was running from from his whole life. This isn't his first encounter here at this wrestling match, for when he was running from Esau, he ran for miles until he was so worn out to where even a stone felt as comfortable as a pillow. As he laid at the head place of the stone, as he laid in this place, he has a dream where it's opened up that we know as of Jacob's ladder, of the revelation of angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth. And he was awakened to the fact that God was with him, and he didn't even know it. 
How amazing it is that you could be so worn out because you're running in fear, so afraid of your life, not even realizing that in spite of your emotions, God is with you. Whether you realize it or you feel like it or not, God is with you. Even if you feel like you're alone, turn to your neighbor and tell him you're not alone. Come on, tell him you're not alone. Jacob has this revelation, and even after having this revelation, it's not like he was tiptoeing through the tulips. It's not like he was following a yellow brick road. He still had his ups and downs. And we find him in this place in the cover of night as he comes into this match where he sends his family ahead across the brook already, and he finds him at a place where he is alone. He sent his family ahead only to find himself wrestling with this person, wrestling not like we know it maybe today. This wasn't... Um, uh, you know, closed lines, drop kicks, and this was actually in a wrestling match where it's not even the punches and the kicks, but it's you're face to face, you're grappling, it's holds, you're throwing, you're, it's, a, it's a wrestling match that takes a lot of strength. And if that's one thing that he would have had, that would have been great. But we already know the testimony that, that it wasn't like his strength was his prime gift. And he finds himself not working in his strength, and he's actually at this place. Isn't it something that we would love to be able to express our strengths, but we find ourselves usually in our wrestling matches with God in our weaknesses. And we find him in this place at night, and at first it's of the cover. I don't know, we, maybe he thought it was Esau that, that knew he was coming and that he was fighting with. He, he didn't really know at the beginning, but we find that he did not give up. That's one thing you can say about Jacob, is he had a tenacity about him that he wasn't going to give up. Seven years, 14 years, I'm not going to give up. Even though I, I, I'm not born right in the right time, I'm not going to give up. I, I want to receive this birthright. I want to receive the Father's blessing, even though if it goes against the tradition and the culture of I am. Sometimes you have a passion on the inside of you that even goes against the culture. Sometimes you have a desire on the inside of you that says, it doesn't add up, two plus two doesn't make sense, but I've got a passion on the inside of me that goes beyond what makes sense. And Jacob was living his life with a passion on the inside of him in such a way that he did not give up. And even though after wrestling of hours, it goes in throughout the whole night until the breaking of day. And if you've ever been up uh, at the time to see the sun come up, you don't see the sun first. It actually, the sky's illuminated by light before you ever see the sun. And the breaking of day, the dawn was breaking. And it's in this moment that we find that he says, you've got to let me go. And somewhere between the midst of the night, somewhere where at the beginning of this struggle, at the beginning of this fight, he would have easily thought it was his enemy. And what do we do, right? When we have looked and evolved our perception and we think that we're actually wrestling with the enemy. We think that we're wrestling with the devil. We're wrestling with the accuser of the brethren only to find out, whoa, it's not the devil. But what do you do when it's God who looks like the enemy? What do you do when it's God who feels like the enemy? What do you do? Jacob didn't give up. Jacob didn't stop. And he's wrestling at these places when it doesn't make sense, when he can't see, and when he's not strong enough. But he didn't give up. And somewhere between the night season and the breaking of the dawn, when it comes to the place saying, we've got to stop this right now, and he says this, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Amen. Somewhere he realized, I am not wrestling Esau. I am not wrestling the enemy. But somewhere in the midst of the struggle, he realized and had the revelation, this is no enemy, but this is God I am wrestling with. And even when God says, time is up, Okay, the, the struggle is up. Some people would have said, thank you, Lord. Some people would have had the drums going and the piano playing and saying, the struggle is over. We have the victory. But that wasn't what Jacob was about. We would have been satisfied with the testimony by the fight is over. Hallelujah. Praise God. But he said, no, I'm not just satisfied with the ending of a struggle. I will not let you go without a blessing. Does somebody have a passion on the inside of them? in such a way, even in the midst of the greatest 
fight of your life, somewhere out of the cry of your heart, cries out for a blessing. Even in the weariness of your fight, even in the, in the place where he's literally touched at the place of the thigh of his, of his socket is out of joint. It couldn't have been easy and it couldn't have felt good. And in the midst of the pain, he's still crying out blessings. Do you know you don't have to be blessed when everything's going right? Did you know you don't have to receive a blessing only in the prayer line with the anointing oil slapped on your forehead? You can receive one of your greatest blessings from God in the midst of the greatest fight of your life. So in whatever season you are in, I don't care. We don't limit it to times and seasons with God. Whether you're walking through hell, you're looking for a blessing. Whether you're up on the mountaintop with a face glowing or down in the valley, he's the God of the hills and he's the God of the valleys. Amen. So somebody ought to be able to cry out with your mouth and say, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. This is Jacob's foresight. This is what's with inside of him. If there's one thing about it, he had a lot of weaknesses in his life, he, but, but he had a tenacity and he was not going to go through without receiving a blessing. Without receiving a blessing. Uh, and it's incredible. Uh, I love it. Hmm. Those surprise attacks when we don't see it coming, whether it's a surprise attack from a doctor's office, maybe a courtroom, maybe a letter from your mortgage company. We've all experienced surprise attacks. Hmm. Haven't we? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And he blesses them right there in the midst of his pain, in the midst of the wrestling match. He blesses him right there. I ask this question because does anybody have any names come to your mind about the sons of Jacob? Not a trick question, but do you know the names? Now, some of you are in here early service, and you're sitting here, for, so you can't answer. Pastor, you can't answer. It's the names of Jacob's sons. Judah, Benjamin, Gad, Simeon. Judah and Benjamin, those are some good names. We know these names. Why? Because they're Jacob's sons. Do you know the names of Esau's sons? Maybe not. Because Jacob, he wasn't even satisfied... Some would have been satisfied with God is with me. I didn't know it. And I had a dream and gone throughout their whole life with the dream of heaven. But Manny, we find him still encountering God. That means after I got saved, I mean, there's more of God than just a salvation prayer. Amen. I mean, after I've been filled with the spirit of God, you mean there's more to this thing than just speaking in tongues? Wow, I've prayed for people, led someone to Jesus, but there's even, I, I can have a relationship with God that forever changes, not just me. But I, God's in this thing from, I, God's in this for more than just you. Because <laughs> he's a God of a generational blessing. Amen. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's sons. They end up becoming the 12 tribes of Israel. Esau did have some sons you might recognize, but you'd maybe, I didn't realize until I started, because I, I actually, you know, went to the source that you always go to, Wikipedia. And, and so, um, oh, no, I'm sorry. No, I was, uh, in uh, Matthew Henry's commentary, it says, um, no. Uh, <laughs> woo! No. Uh, did I say that? No, I'm just teasing. Amalek was one of Esau's sons. Sound familiar? He's one of the great enemies of Israel. Uh, the Edomites come from Esau. Matter of fact, it kind of goes back to before Jacob and Esau were even born, the word of the Lord came to him and said, because remember, they were fighting barrenness, just like their mother and father before them could not have children. And the message comes, not only are you going to have one, but you have two nations inside of you. Yeah. And the word came forth by saying, the older will serve the younger. Yeah. And that didn't make sense. Is that something how God can speak something that doesn't compute? Yeah. And somehow you better watch out because he knows what he's talking about, right? Because he knows the end from the beginning, right? 
See, that, that, that he, he, he's, he knows him from the beginning. And, and so he's sitting here and saying, there's two nations inside of you. And, and we find that many of the enemies of Israel were actually Esau's. Now, that's a whole other dynamic called family, but that's, you know, that's a different sermon. I ain't going there. <laughs> and, and he says, God, I'll not let you go till you bless me. And then he says, what's your name? What's your name? And I love this because when we see in all this, we see the beauty of God unraveling, unfolding a blessing greater than what he could have expected. What is your name? My name is Heel Grabber. My, my story isn't something I'm necessarily proud of. Maybe he was blessed, but maybe he went around some different ways to get the blessing. Maybe his testimony wasn't what he thought he would like it to be. But God says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Heel Grabber. And he says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but I call you Israel. Amen. Why? Because you have prevailed with God. And with men. <laughs> you want me to go longer, don't you? He says, I'm calling you of Israel, Prince of God. You have prevailed with God and with man. You have a prevailing desire with inside of you that would not give up. And you shall no longer. And I, we, we touched on this last week, though. But, but God is referenced even after this wrestling moment, after this name-changing encounter. 65 times he's referenced as the God of Jacob. I, would, I mean, if I was God, I would be wanted to be recognized as the God of Israel. But we have to love the God that we serve that says, I'm not just the God of Israel. I'm also the God of Jacob. I'm not just the God of your prevailing power. I'm also the God of your weakness. I am the God of your wrestlings. I am the God of your low points. I am the God of Jacob. 65 times. Come on, Gateway. Come on. 65 times. That's the God we serve. Because he doesn't mind because he's also part of the transition of the God of Israel. Why? Because he's gone before us. He's gone before us and he's prepared the way. He knows he's been there in the future. Right? Amen. And he's waiting for us to arrive. Yeah. And I wish I would have, I would have uh, penned this, or the first one to say it. But you'll look a whole lot better in the future than you'll look right now. Right. Come on, Gateway. He's gone before us. He's prepared the way. He's waiting for us in our future. How many are you ready to step and to go to where God is into your future? He said before he was born, there's two nations. The older will serve the younger. They called you, life has called you one thing. But don't you ever forget what God has declared over you. Hallelujah. The God who knew you in your mother's womb has declared purpose over your life. He says, I have an expected end for you. Don't ever, don't ever forget about God's, what God has called you in your life. And regardless of what life has named you, regardless of what mistakes that you have made, God isn't speaking to the Jacob inside of you. God didn't begin to speak. Obviously, he speaks to the Israel inside of you. Why? Because that's who God has called you to be. While you were sitting there wrestling, and by the way, so much of even the sermons that I have spoken and what has touched me, I'll never forget sitting on the front row of a Benningham Partners Conference, sitting there with tears coming down my face, trying not to look like a blubbering idiot, as Benny Hinn spoke about back then, about wrestling with God. <laughs> if only I would have known. <laughs> <laughs> He spoke on wrestling with God back then, and he spoke about how God couldn't trust him until he walked with a limp. Yeah. If you ever see someone that walks with a limp, you see somebody that God trusts. Wow. And it's at this place of absolute surrender that Jacob could no longer lean on his own, but he leaned upon and surrendering of God that we see him walking into his this fullest of destiny of Israel. Who God had called him to be. Man. You have prevailed with God. 
Lord, that our testimony be that we have prevailed with you. God, obviously man is great, but our heart's desire is, God, we want to prevail with you. Lord, I declare, I speak to the Israel inside of each and every one here this morning. I speak to the Israel with inside. Lord, I thank you for the declaration of the songs and the words spoken over them, over heaven's word, over their life, God. Regardless of what net life has named them, regardless of what they've gone by, regardless of their reputation, God, I thank you you're bringing forth the unfolding and the manifested promises that eternity past has spoken over each and every one. Each and every one. Each and every one. When we go to the first verse that we started with, that we read out of Genesis 32, it says, when Jacob was left alone and a, a man wrestled with him. How many sermons have we heard of Jacob wrestling with God? Totally missing the very first verse. This was not Jacob wrestling with God. Yet, in spite of what we believe, even in our own life, it was God wrestling with him. Do you think Jacob was really strong enough to keep up with God all night? Do you think God really didn't know his name when he asked him his name? God in this place is wrestling with Jacob, not Jacob wrestling with God. There's no contest in a wrestling match with God. Anybody have experience can say amen. How many have cried out mercy? Remember as kids when you play the game of knuckles and what do you have to cry out? Some of you didn't go, it didn't take you all night. You cried out mercy within the first minutes. I know I have. I can't tell you the times I've cried out for mercy. I cried out for mercy. For even in the beginning of time, I don't see Adam calling out for God. Adam is hiding in the bushes while there comes one as the sound of his voice walking in the garden, crying out and calling out, Adam, where are you? This was not Adam finding God. Jesus puts it this way. He says it's the shepherd. It's actually, we find in the Gospels, it's the shepherd that goes and leaves the 99 to grab the one. There's none of us as a sheep that's ever wandered back to God. There's none of us that's ever come back off the cliff and come back to God. As good as we like to think we are, as the best decisions we've ever made in our life, it was never us going to God. But we serve a God who came and left the 99 and found us. Aren't you glad God found you? Come on, you, crazy you. Pig slop, wiping off, eating you. You weren't the one. God came running, wrapped his arms around you. While you came walking with your shoulders hung down, God came running with the embrace of the robe, the ring, and sandals upon your feet. You didn't make the decision. And I can say this, under obviously that we know. We did not find God. But God found us. And aren't you glad you're found? Aren't you glad in his mercy he came finding you? It's not you wrestling with God. It's been God wrestling with you. And the moment we have this revelation at that place that I quit fighting with everything I know that I can do, and if I quit scheming and trying to manipulate, can you imagine trying to manipulate God? But we have. We've tried, and we don't have a limp yet. Don't work. <laughs> if we'd stop trying to do it with our strength, trying to make things happen, and we come to a place of surrender, we can find in our surrendered state we'll accomplish much more than we ever would when we're given in our striving state. Man. We find when we actually lift up and say, okay, God, I surrender. It's not the devil fighting you. Wow. Have you ever heard the devil 
trying to tell you to forgive that person, that yeah. nasty, mean devil? Have we ever wrestled? Yeah. God, you want me to do what? You want me to say, I'm sorry, and they're the ones that... <laughs> yeah, that devil's crazy. Hmm. How many times it's been God wrestling with us. Yeah. And we find that I think God really didn't need Jacob's permission to let up. I think God could have ended that wrestling match at the very beginning. But there came to a place of Jacob's surrender that brought forth the cry, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the blessings of one of the greatest pains in his life, he finds out who he truly is. Yeah. <laughs> He found out his greatest destiny, his greatest identity, and who he was in the midst of this wrestling match. You're not Jacob. You are Israel. You're not who you thought you were. You know who you are? You're a manifestation of the promise I gave to your grandfather. Man. You're not Jacob. You are the promise that I gave to Abraham standing outside of his tent talking about how he's going to be the father of nation. Look at the stars, Abraham. Look at the stars. Jacob, you are the nation and you are the promise that I gave to your grandfather. Amen. God's promises are yes and amen. Isn't it exciting that we have an opportunity to put a voice to his promise? Isn't it time that we become the amen to his promise? That we become a promise fulfilled and, a, and put the promises that he's given to our family members or to people that we've never done. Maybe your parents have never been saved. Maybe you're a first generation Christian and you're still a promise fulfilled. Amen. As the worship team comes, everybody's standing this morning. Jacob, not wrestling with God, but it's God wrestling with Jacob. As much as we're passionate in our heart, there is one that's more passionate than we are. You think you know what love is. He is love. You think you love God, but who loved first? It's not me. That I chose and I love you, but he first loved me. Matter of fact, we heard it best from the song this morning. When we didn't know we needed a Savior, we had one whose love was stretched out wide open for us anyways. We didn't even know we needed it. Aren't you glad that he loves us even when we didn't know we needed it? Aren't you glad because he said, Jacob, I declared this over you even in your mother's womb. Yeah. Jacob, I've gone before you. You are Israel. And that's why he sees us from the end. He's been there in our future. He speaks to us according to where he's called us to be. This ain't the only one. Simeon, Simon, Peter. You shall no longer be called Simon, which is a reed that drifts in the wind. But you shall be called the rock. Was Peter always a rock? <laughs> now, if you get a word from Jesus, I would expect that word to be solid. And it was. His name was changed. And even through some ups and downs and still some swaying, he still was a rock because he was speaking to his destiny and who he was called to be. And you may be cowering in fear by a 12-year-old girl in this night, but there will be a day where you walk with your own cross and you ask to be crucified upside down, Peter, because you are a rock, Peter. Man. Why? He changes our name and he speaks to us according to not where we are, but where he's called us to be. And he's gone before us, he's seen us in the future, and he is not only with us right now, with the awakening there that he's with us and I didn't even know it, but he's also waiting for me in my future. And he's calling forth the Israel inside of you this morning. He's calling forth his promise he's declared over you here this morning. Prince and princesses of God, prevailers of God and with man, that's who you are. That's who you are. 
Is this on this morning? You want me to go long? You want to miss lunch? You want a revival service pastor was talking about five hours, don't you? I said, you are the prevailers of God. Those who will not give up. Those who will reach and keep on reaching. Those who will ask. Those who will seek. And those that will knock. And we're not knocking because of our passion and our love. The only reason why we knock is because we can hear the reverberation of one who is knocking on the door of our hearts. We knock with the passion of a desire of what's de deposited of the treasure with inside of us. So God, I thank you for opening ears to hear the sound of your fist knocking upon the doors of our hearts. At the places we thought we had opened up to you. At the places that we thought we had surrendered to you. Lord, we come to the place we thank you for leading us into the absolute surrender. That we quit putting on the fake mask. That we quit manipulating. That we quit the striving of something and trying to make something happen. Bring us into the absolute surrender. And I thank you that you are raising up the Israel inside of your people here this morning. Right now. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on. Reach out and tell them, I'll not let you go till you bless me, God. I'm not going to stop into the blessings of the Lord. I'm not going to go through this without a harvest. I'm not going to go through this without a blessing. I'm not going to be able to, I'm, I'm, I'm right, I'm not letting go until a blessing, oh God. If you're here this morning, whatever your prayer request may be, the pastors and the ministry team is going to be up here. We're going to worship with this song. But for the rest, you just worship with us. And we love you so much, and we'll see you tonight.